everyone know that we're recording this session um, so that you can listen to it again afterwards, but also so that people who aren't able to join us live can listen to it again too, so we can hold this um, on record at SOAS, and I think also with some of the participants involved. Um, this is the third part of a series of conversations that have been curated by colleagues at the SOAS Centre for, Gen Center for Gender Study as part of the SOAS Festival of Ideas called Transnational Dialogues. And the idea behind these dialogues is that we meet together colleagues from SOAS, talk with, with colleagues around the world to think about the connections that have been brought about by COVID, so shared global lockdowns, economic downturns and recessions, but also about the ruptures and disconnects and the differences in the ways in which COVID is impacting all our lives across the world, but also within very close geographic proximity. We've talked a lot in the media, or there's been a lot of talk in the media about um, COVID being an unprecedented event, something that's been unknown in our lifetimes. And yet at the same time, so many ways in which the pandemic is working reveals um, and, and exacerbates long established inequalities and violences that have structured lifetime, structured society for many lifetimes. So we've got this kind of disconnect between something new on the one hand, but, but something that is actually revealing ongoing um, inequalities and, and actually making them worse in many ways. And so this panel is looking at this, the, this tension um, or these processes through a focus on the archive in particular. And that focus is, is, comes from, from my own particular interests. I'm the one who's kind of um, roped everybody into this. And my name is Eleanor Newbegin. I'm a lecturer in South Asian history, modern South Asian history in the history department at SOAS. Um, and uh, I'm also very interested, as well as the history of modern South Asia, I'm interested in questions about histories of race, of gender, and, and of what it means to decolonize history teaching in Britain at the moment. And those interests have come from teaching at SOAS itself. So SOAS has, uh, is the only university in the UK that teaches a BA and MA history program um, that trains students in history through a unique focus on Africa, Asia, and the Middle East. Um, we teach European histories because those histories are intimately connected to the histories of Africa, Asia and the Middle East, but we do so through a different focus. And that different focus actually asks questions about the very nature of history itself, the discipline and how it works. Um, and the archive is a central point of those discussions. The classic archive is an archive produced by the state. That's a record of society through the state's eye view. Um, organized around social categories and social problems as they're perceived by those who are in power. And it's important to recognize that kind of official logic of the state, whatever kind of history you write, but it's particularly important if you're writing histories of regions that have been under European domination, European colonialism. Post-colonial theorists and historians have played a prominent role in critiquing that idea of the archive, but so too have people working outside of the academy, people working in, in the real world, uh, who've been involved in activism and in, in building collections that don't just critique the archive, but do so in a way that produces a different kind of archive, that actually collect, collects um, evidence, experiences and feelings of people who are marginalized by that dominant archive. And so that work is important, I feel, not just in critiquing academic arguments about the archive, but actually producing a different idea of the archive. The archive is a space of activism and a space of challenge uh, to, to dominant narratives. So it's that engagement with the archive that led me to think about how we remember COVID and to, to ask our participants in the panel to be part of this conversation. I'm going to introduce our three speakers briefly now because I've actually asked them to do that work of introducing themselves in, in just a moment and I'll explain that. Um, but we've got three, I'm very lucky to be joined by three people today. We have Linda Chernis, who is the activist at Gala Queer Archives in Johannesburg, which is an archive co connected to the Gala Centre for Lesbian, Gay, Bisexual, Transgender, Intersex and Queer Culture and Education in South Africa. We also have Sivasai Jivanantham, who is a graduate of the National Institute of Design in India. So Siv is a photographer and journalist who's based in Chennai, but who's been working most recently in Indian occupied Kashmir uh, and who wrote a brilliant piece in The Wire several months ago about his work that inspired me to set up this panel. So I recommend reading it. Um, and our third speaker is Adira 
Sekhubatil, who is also a graduate of the National Institute of Design in India. Uh, Adira is based in Kolkata, but with strong roots to Kerala. Uh, and Adira is a photographer, curator, and exhibition designer. So the idea behind these webinars is that they are informal conversations. They're not academic presentations, even though I'm talking to you at length now. Um, but, and, and so the idea is that we, the four of us, will talk for about 45 minutes and then we'll open up to our audience. Um, and we'll invite you to ask questions, but also contribute to the discussion too. We are going to ask you to do that via text because that's the most efficient way to bring in information uh, and to, to kind of keep the conversation flowing. Um, on the right hand side of your screen, there'll be a chat function which will open up in about just as we're beginning to round up our, our discussion and open space for you. Uh, and so do please start by saying where you are in the world, because we know that we're being joined by people from, from all over, uh, and then use that to put your question to, to members of the panel. So we are going to move now into a conversation, but as you can already see, I, I like you know, to, to organize and dominate things. Uh, so we've, we have got a bit of a structure for this conversation, just to explain that. Um, I'm going to ask all our, 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 my, my co-conversationalists to introduce themselves and say a little bit about the work that they've done so far. Uh, and we'll talk, we'll use that as a base to talk about this idea of critical archiving or activist archiving, what that means, what it entails, the kind of impact it can have. Um, and then we'll move on to talk about how everybody's lives have been affected in their work by, by COVID before we open up this bigger question about how could we build a critical archive of COVID. And that's definitely where we want your input to from the audience because we we know that's not a question we can answer we're just being daring in asking it and and would like your views on that too um so i'm going to start by handing over to to linda um do you want to take over linda shall i open up your slides for you and explain your work so far and talk us through that sure um i'm going to try and keep this brief because I can't give you the whole history of, um, of GALA. Um, GALA is the, the acronym and, and what we call ourselves. Uh, originally, the Gay and Lesbian Archives, and now we just call ourselves GALA Queer Archives. Um, we're based in Johannesburg in South Africa, and I've been the archivist at GALA for the last five years. Um, so GALA acts as a, a traditional archive in, a, in the sense that we have documents and records and a lot of paper-based stuff which people come and use research but we also do quite a lot of other work um, we do book publishing exhibitions uh, we do training and education and youth work um, yeah so we do a lot of stuff and so we try and find a balance between queer activism and and being an archive and we haven't always gotten that balance right we're trying to get better at it um, and we also act as a as a safe space. We're based on uh, the university campus, the University of the Bitmatis Rand Spitz in Johannesburg. Um, so although we're an independent NPO, we are based on the university campus, which is nice. Um, and our, our library is, is uh, as you can see in the picture there, it's used a lot not only by researchers but also um, by youth using it as a, a queer safe space. We hold uh, weekly youth forum meetings there. Um, yeah, and it's obviously now it's closed and, and that's one of, oh, we'll get to that later, but it's, it's part of the impact that we have that that safe space now closed. Um, so just briefly to tell you, I mean, we have over 200 collections. Uh, they range from one file to boxes. They include uh, LGBTI organizations in South Africa, events, side marches, personal collections, um, press clippings. It, there's a really a wide variety. Um, and I, I just want to briefly just show you as an example of one of our recent projects, which was an exhibition called QP Daughter of District 6. And this is based on one uh, on our largest photographic collection of Gala. Uh, QP was a hairdresser and performer based in District 6 in Cape Town in the 60s and 70s. This was a sort of very turbulent time in South African history when um, 
the apartheid government was forcibly removing people from areas like District 6, which were mixed race areas, and forcibly removing them out of the city centers and declaring those white areas. So although that's, that history is pretty well known in South Africa, the history of forced removals, but uh, we wanted to tell a lesser known aspect of that story, which was um, the, the queer community in District 6. And these photographs show that really beautifully. Um, yeah, I think I'll leave the rest to when we start talking about our work during the time of COVID. I think that's enough of an intro for now. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks. Brilliant. Thanks, Linda. Um, Sibba, do you want to speak a bit about your work too? Let me get your slides up. Yeah. Um, do you want me to go through them? Can you can you do the slides or shall I do them? What would be? I think I'll do that. It's okay. Sure. So, cool. Yeah. Hi everyone. Um, I'm Siva Sajivanand. Um, I just completed my master's in photography design from National Institute of Design. So I've been practicing photography since 2012, and my area of inquiry is to look at the conflict, human conflict, more of a personal conflict as well. So. My inquiry is the idea of good and bad in the society and the moral questions that we usually impose on ourselves to think about what is good and what is bad. So I work with different mediums, majorly documentary, journalistic, as well as archives. So my, um, I just started archiving recently for my project about Kashmir. So otherwise I used to uh, photograph social issues in and around India, and that I relate to more. So these are four, more, uh, four important projects that I've worked for the past four years. So if you see the, uh, the major core of all these project ideas is conflict, the idea of good and bad, starting from upside down, which is uh, which talks about Indian education system and how it works on a flawed idea of success. And if you see Indian education system, most of our parents, uh, Indian parents, they have a set of formulas for success. That is, you have to complete your high school and then you have to get into a engineering or science technological related studies and then you have to go for, from there. While uh, my second project is based in Kashmir. Kashmir project is, uh, it sort of evolved from my uh, interest and my life throughout. So I'm not a Kashmiri, I'm not a local. So my, uh, I'm an outsider for Kashmir. So the, the ways I choose to talk about Kashmir was influenced from uh, from other people I met in Kashmir. So I'll, I'll explain it briefly when I'm talking about the project in depth. So other, uh, my last two projects are avant-garde politics, which talks about the political issue in Tamil Nadu, where the political parties are giving free goodies. They promise free goodies like kitchen appliances, laptops, and cycles to win elections. And my very first project back in 2017 was Animals in Love. It talks about, uh, it's a moral question of human-animal relationship. So I photographed a set of five zoo files in the Western part of the world. Zoo files are people who have emotional, sexual, or platonic relationship with their domesticated animals. So most of us, when we are talking about uh, animals and human relationship, we always see them as pet and anything beyond that is a cruel inhumane hack. But for these people, the pet that they're living with, they're also in love with their pet, like as in wife, husband relationship between them. So these are certain things that I used to question through my projects, or through my work. Yeah. So that's a short introduction about me. 
Do you want to talk through any of your, your pictures, Ziva? Do you want to show some of the work? Yeah, sure. Can I start? Can I do it now? Or? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do that. Sure. So uh, this is my project upside down where I'm talking about kids and how parents are usually controlling each and every act of kids. Like uh, in an Indian scenario, we always want our kids to be an engineer or a, uh, some technology oriented person who can earn more and get a living. So anything out of this direction is a taboo in India. And we, uh, the Indian culture always has this uh, tradition of behaving. If you're not behaving, then you're, you know, you're termed, you're outcast. So it talks about kids who are, um, were not behaving basically. So the act of kids where, uh, I see the act of kids not behaving as a rebellion against the parents. So it's a performance between uh, me as a photographer and the kids, where, where the kids perform to me the things that their parents won't accept or the society won't accept or the society deems as something, you know, that a kid is not supposed to do. Rather, the kid should be studying or doing something related to education. So I'll quickly go through the photographs. So for this project, I photographed uh, kids from different economic and social backgrounds in and around Chennai. So the process goes in like, um, I have a conversation with the kids and they come up with ideas within their environment, whatever is feasible, they come up with ideas and then they perform it. These ideas are basically things that their parents won't allow them to do or the society things, you know, this is too naughty, they should be studying or things like that. It also takes us to the surreal space and mind of a child. Uh, we have always been there. So, yeah. And uh, this is my Kashmir project where I'm working with archives, collected images from uh, victims of enforced disappearances and other human rights violations. Uh, I see Kashmir as a window to talk about the state oppression. And when I was a child, my parents were uh, very much involved with the uh, Tamil era movement. So that kind of uh, provoked me to start looking at other places where uh, the state oppression is being a major issue and a lot of human rights violation is, is committed in the name of nationality or patriotism. So that led me to Kashmir five years ago and archiving as a, uh, as a process came in later on after I started working on different projects in Kashmir. So these are photographs that I collected from victims of enforced disappearances. Enforced disappearances is when uh, people have been abducted by the army without a proper arrest warrant and you can't find them. It's mostly custodial death, but the army uh, does not acknowledge it as a custodial death. So the family is left out with idea where the person is. Usually the army tells the family that the person crossed the border and went to Pakistan for military training to become a terrorist. So these photographs also talk about uh, how memory is not the same when we're revisiting it. For example, this photo in the left of uh, Bashir Salim Pare was taken as a family portrait with his friend who is hidden in this. And later on in his laughter, he disappeared. The same photo has become a mugshot for the missing person's report. So we don't have control over images and we don't have control over how the images are going to be used in the future, especially in a conflict zone like Kashmir. And these are more images of uh, Abdul Rashid Para, who was abducted by the army. 
and his wife Zina, Zina Begum. These are very intimate family portraits of uh, the couple. This is wedding portrait. And uh, this is Zina Begum and uh, Abdul Rashid together during their first vacation after marriage, which is supposed to be a honeymoon. And these are uh, this is a photo of Zina and uh, Abdul. And behind the photo, we can see a lot of descriptions written by Zina after Abdul's abduction. And there is a small I love you written in this behind, behind these photographs. When we think of Kashmir and Kashmiri women or children, the imagery that we often see is, uh, you know, the hijab clad woman or the child with a toy gun is, is a famous imagery or, uh, or a child's uh, pelting stones. But the archive that I was looking at brought, uh, opened up a, a new uh, perspective to the Kashmir imagery where I could see uh, Zina wearing Abdul's shirt when I asked Zina what, what is this photograph about and she started explaining how her husband wanted her to wear his shirt and his hat and take a very modern portrait when we think of Kashmir we always think of uh, Islamic uh, you know how Islam is oppressing women and uh, children and sort of brainwashing them into militancy while if we are looking at these photographs it's actually not him and it's actually not true. It becomes a state-sponsored uh, history that we are reading rather than the reality itself. So, yeah. Great. Thank you, Siva. That's a really full um, tour of, of, of your project. Adira, do you want to, to speak a bit about your work too? Should we yeah. open that? Yeah. that? Um, okay, uh, hello everybody. My name is Adira Dekuvitil and I am a photographer by training. I'm also a graduate of the National Institute of Design in Ahmedabad in India, um, but a little before Sivasai. And uh, since I graduated, I've been working as a researcher, as a curator, as a, an exhibition designer, but I also do personal projects based on photography. And um, the, the, the project that I'm going to talk about at length for this panel is going to be focused around uh, a project, collaborative project that I've been working on with a team of people uh, called the Anglo-Indian Archives. So before that, I'll just briefly take you through um, some of some of the other work that I've also been doing. Um, so in recent, in the last three years, I've also been based out of Calcutta, where I've been thinking about what it means to have a metropolis like Calcutta, and thinking about the role of various people within that. So one of the things is that uh, a large part of my family is also from Calcutta. So over the last three, four years, I've been working on a project sort of thinking about what family relationships mean and what also the role of the city and the metropolis plays within that, which is also connected to uh, another project looking at the urban landscape itself. So these are slightly sort of connected projects, but they are somewhat separate as well. But this is uh, my photographic work. Um, the project that I was talking about earlier is called um, the Anglo-Indian Archives. And so what we have been uh, doing around that project has been to, uh, it's, a, it's a team project. So um, my slides are going a bit off, but um, so this is a project which I've been doing, working on with a team of people. Uh, as you can see, we're a core team of three people, which is composed of Vidhi Prakash, who is a photographer and a curator based in Delhi, who has worked extensively around the Anglo Indian community and has made a lot of work, photographic work around the Anglo Indian community. And we are also working with another graduate of the National Institute of Design, Sheikh uh, Mohammed Ishaq, who is also a part of our process in, in, in the way in which we collect the archive and manage it and compose it. And since none of us, all three of us are not from the Anglo Indian community, we also rely very heavily on mentors from the Anglo Indian community. And the two mentors who we have been working with for the last two years have been Harry McClure, who is a Chennai based writer, a book illustrator, playwright, and screenwriter 
who has been publishing and editing a magazine called Anglos in the Wind, which is a very, very important magazine which comes out of Chennai and is one of the very few sort of literary publications um, available for exclusively talking about the Anglo Indian community in India. He also runs a publishing house called Anglo Indian Books. And uh, we've also been working with uh, the acclaimed Anglo-Indian writer, Irvin Allen Seeley, who is a novelist and a poet. So you can see that the team is quite diverse in that sense. And one of the um, key things that we were concerned about, especially with regards to the Anglo-Indian community, was that a lot of, when we think of photography, especially the archive, there is a sense of sort of you know, it being a, a, a historical collection of things which have frozen in time in a way. So the collection almost becomes slightly, um, you know, already in the process of collecting itself, there's a datedness to it and it becomes very stifled in the way that it is thought about as well. So this is one of the things that we were also thinking about when we began thinking about the project itself as to how we can rethink or reconsider the way an archive is looked at and can we then think of ways in which we can uh, sort of challenge that. Um, and the, the um, yeah, so one of the things that is also very prominent about representation of the Anglo-Indian community post independence in India is that there has been a lot of misrepresentation of the community. Now the Anglo-Indian community is also a, has a fraught place in Indian history because of the impacts of colonialism and because this community sort of came in between, um, you know, came in between both the Indian side and the British side. And so there was a lot of um, post independence, there was a lot of um, sort of, especially in media, there was a lot of uh, misrepresentation of, about this community and considering the ways in which they were stereotyped, especially in cinema, in music, and in a lot of other uh, sort of mass media. So that is something that, especially when looking at a visual archive and collecting photographs, you are sort of directly in conflict sometimes with this established stereotype. And one also has to think about ways in which one can think about that. So, um, so we of course went through a lot of uh, rounds of making a proposal that would actually make some meaning to the fact of why we wanted to do this archive, why, why we wanted to collect these images and why we wanted it to be accessible to a larger audience. And all, all of these questions were sort of racked through the, the months that we spent in actually creating a proposal before we even began the project or before we even actually went out into the field. So a lot of the questions that we were considering were asked and were Sort of thought over before we went onto the field and this is us on the field when we actually went into homes of Anglo Indian uh, community members in and around Chennai so this this leg of it was done in 2018 in late 2018 when we, we did our first field visit where we visited um, around 10 Anglo Indian families and actually sort of began the process of asking them if they would be you know if they would be willing to be a part of this collection and if they would be if they would agree to share their family photographs with us and that is another thing that is something that is often sort of a tricky area because the family archive is also very intimate and very personal and when one hands that over to quote unquote an organization of any sort or even and, and and at this point we're still not an organization. And so there's a lot of questions that you know we have to go still back and forth with these families as to why we need these photographs, what are we going to do with them, how are we going to use them and what does that mean for a larger audience as well. So a lot of our field visits was also in 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 doing oral history interviews and collecting uh, stories from the families about the photographs themselves. And as you can see here, we were in very varied environments when we were collecting this uh, these uh, when we were digitizing these albums. So we were in all sorts of environments, and so we also had to think of ways in which we could work quickly in the field. And uh, that's Sheikh there, uh, who's photographing the albums for us with a cat. Um, so once we did have this material sort of gathered for the first round of our uh, of our archiving process in Chennai, we actually then had to go through all of these photographs and then think about ways in which to make sense of what we were actually looking at. Now this is another process that we are still 
reconsidering over and over again as we go through the archive because there are this is the thing about photography that there are a hundred thousand ways in which one can think about any image a, a photograph of a person's wedding uh, could could mean is obviously meaning something else to the family uh, to whom that photograph belongs and to their children and grandchildren but means something very different when we look at it in context with five other wedding albums or you know or or five other photographs of different people in different situations in different times so all of this had to also be considered and this is a process that i think that you know as archivists or as people involved in thinking about the archive one needs to constantly go over again and again as to how the various meanings come together and also challenge each other so one um you know so this is a process that we're still doing that uh, after chennai we did another leg of the young union project archive project where we also uh, did a, a short field visit to guwahati in assam uh, where an intern of our um, pranami rajwangshi who you can see standing and doing an interview with the family is uh, was another leg of the project that we did where we also then collected uh, more family albums from families in chennai and digitized those i mean i'm sorry in guwahati and digitized those so again like there was a vast difference in family albums of course of uh, the community living in guwahati assam as compared to in chennai so that is another process that we are also sort of going through in the in the way as to how we sort of map all of this together um i'll just quickly jump to another um slide so you can see that this is a map of india and we have close to 15 locations where we would ideally want to go and do these field visits and gather this data i mean this uh, digitize these family albums because the anglo indian community was also so spread out all across the country and they have a long history of the manner in which specifically they were living in specific areas of the country based on uh, their profession especially many anglo indian community members were were uh, based in uh, areas which had strong links to the railway lines to postal telegraph to the armed forces so that also has a historical place in thinking about geography and thinking about land and also thinking about what those histories then how that connects back into um, thinking about the country as itself so one of our objectives going forward uh, which 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 is of course that this archive is is important to first to make the archive to actually collect all of this information but then it has to be accessible and our core idea is that it has to be accessible to people of the anglo indian community and not just the anglo indian community in india but a large part of the anglo indian community has also become part of the larger diaspora around the globe especially in places like in in, in europe in the americas in australia and new zealand so it's 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 sort of very important for us also to connect with people from those geographies as well and have a conversation with people from various parts of the parts of the globe who may also be thinking not just of their own histories but also maybe scholars and other people who would be interested in working around the the uh, the anglian community so at this juncture um, in the last few months uh, post covid we have actually intensified our um, sort of our um, efforts in actually digitize i mean getting this uh, archive online and creating a space for that because it is now more than ever it is most important that you know archives are actually having an online space because we are we aren't able to actually connect to people um physically anymore and although we have done a few exhibitions these are some press clippings from some of the exhibitions that we've done in chennai and we've also got some physical catalogs and other things from these exhibitions so the thing is that you know it's it's important that we have um the archive as a space in which it these uh, not just the photographs but also these oral histories can rest and can then be uh, thought about later but also that they have to be constantly accessible and then we can get those questions from people from the community because you know most of the people who are on the core team right now are not the anglo indian community so that is very important for us to constantly question our own role within those archive as well so so yeah so that's me thanks adira that's great and and moves us into this conversation about what happens with covid too um and i would like to get to that but before we do Um I mean you talked us through there very coherently the the process of curating for your exhibition but which other which both Sivan and Linda have also talked about briefly in their presentations too and and in different ways all three of you have 
talked about the kind of the insider outsider relationship in your work. I think you know that that you're there is an act of observation that's going on in building the archive uh, that you're putting forward and thinking about kind of communicating to a, a number of different audiences. And I'd like to ask you all to think a bit more of that and perhaps kind of starting with Linda, um, who you, you, you began the conversation um, and, and was very restrained, you were very restrained in your, in your timing. Um, but thinking about, um, I guess, the ethics of archiving here too. You talked about, Linda, in, in your presentation about the sort of tension between activism and archiving. Um, and so I guess, how, how have you found this relationship as being a kind of, it, the insider and outsider communi community, is, you know, is an archivist always looking in or what, what's different about archivism that comes from within a community out? I think it's different with every project. Um, you know, Gala used to call itself a community archive and, and we sort of re thought that and, and we no longer have that as our sort of tagline because what is a community? I mean, you know, saying that the, the queer community in South Africa is just too broad and that there are too many subgroups and I, I don't think it's a sort of cohesive group. So, yeah, I mean, we, 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 we've struggled with that a bit. Um, are we an activist archive? Yes, I think so. <laughs> um, it's, you know, every project's different. The exhibition we spoke about, that I spoke about briefly, the, the QP exhibition, um, we, we did that in partnership with the District 6 Museum in Cape Town. And that was very important. Um, and we did a lot of public programming and workshops with um, former residents and to really get the buy-in from the community and, and their support and their participation. Um, so yeah, it's, everyone's different. You know, currently we're working on an oral history project in uh, Mozambique. And that's something we've wanted to do for a while, but we needed to find somebody who um, who had a network there, who could speak Portuguese, who, um, you know, so every project has its own set of uh, of difficulties and 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 ways in which we, we need to, to connect with, with the people involved. Um, yeah, so I don't think there's one answer to that question. Every, yeah, everyone's different. <laughs> No, that's but but so but uh, multiple relationships about the kind of the, the community that you're working with, but also thinking about audience there too. And Siva, you talked about that a little bit with your work on Kashmir about produce, you know, the same image being used for different audiences. Um, yeah. What has how have you thought about that question of audience as you've worked on 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 your Kashmir project in particular? Well, actually, when I started this project when i went to all the families and met them the family had a different idea of the photograph like for them the photograph and the documents itself is an archive they they see the the, the file bag and the boxes that they save these photographs in and they talk about how the person would have grown just like how these archives are growing and these file files and other documents in their houses are growing. So when you talk about, uh, it's a community of people who still hold on to these memories and they want to uh, reach, take this out to many audiences. While uh, I work with uh, APDP, Association of Parents of Disappeared Persons, uh, who have been working on this for a long time and they have collected a lot of documents, while my project is just an extension of theirs where I'm collecting family photographs. And looking at, when I saw the family photograph being cut out and made into a document in their file, that shows how we don't have control over the photographs. And the meaning of the photographs also keeps changing. With the family, the photograph of, uh, there was a photo of, uh, a militant with a gun and for them it was a very proudful moment back in 1990s and the wife talks about how that photograph uh, how she was fine and how she was proud about her husband going getting into militancy but now when she goes and looks back to that photograph it's not the same feeling now she's worried about her own thoughts and she she's feeling like I should have stopped him at that time so that you know, he would have stayed back for his season, but 
yet she's still proud of her husband getting into and fighting taking the rebel so yeah the the images are keep on we we have we take images for a certain reason but it's not the same when we are revisiting it again and especially in a conflict zone that it, it's a big difference that makes mm-hmm. how we have never thought about uh, a birthday photograph of take my family i've ne- i would have never thought that my birthday photograph would become uh, a document a mugshot for a missing report of myself so that made me understand how we don't have control over the images mm-hmm. and adira you talked at the end of your presentation about kind of embracing online space which of course we're all desperately trying to do right now um how in what sense is that expansion onto online space a democratizing of the archive that you're building you know you're talking about reaching out to different communities across the world and in what sense does it is it complicating this experience that Siv is talking about that actually fixing meaning becomes even more complicated with this online space too so through your anglo indian project in particular do you see the move online to be uh, about expanding audiences or, or complicating who has who makes meaning from these images yeah i mean i think uh, one also takes the role of the archivist very seriously especially in academic spaces and you know in, in and even as us uh, because we spend so much time with this archive but we also take ourselves very seriously as we sort of imagine a sense of control over it uh, which is a which is a fallacy i think because one can never actually have any control especially over photography it's one of the most you know it's one of those mediums in which the spectator has as much of a right to determine what the image means as the subject as the photographer and that is always going to be the case so for us one of the things that is so important for us to in order to make this archive uh, very accessible and democratize it on the online space is so that we also can be challenged in our own understandings about this because we are the ones who are doing the collecting so we are also the ones who are deciding which photographs to digitize which ones to leave which ones which families do we even have access to and so a lot of that you know, who are we leaving behind in that process when we are collecting things is a is a very crucial question that i think that you know when the online sphere allows for a lot of other people to come into that conversation definitely people from the anglo indian community for sure but also others who might have been scholars working on it just regular people who might be interested in photography the regular people who might be interested in history and just people in general you know and i think we need to be able to open that up because the archive also should not have this imperial idea about collecting keeping and labeling and you know and that's it also be placed that way that way thank you linda can we come back you 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 cut your presentation off short because actually of everyone involved in the conversation you are still i mean every, we'll, i'll i'll talk to adira and siva about how covid has impacted their work but you are gala is still working right um and you've got some projects there so maybe you could talk about how this move to online has impacted the work that you're doing um would you like me to open up the slides again yes please um just to say briefly as well um just before you know we went into sort of lockdown in south africa at the end of march uh we actually a two year digitization project that we've been working on with um gale in the us uh was finalized and so 25 of our collections were put online through the um archives of gender and sexuality series so that was very good timing for us um <laughs> it meant that researchers could access at least those 25 collections um so that was great um so as you'll see in the slide here i mentioned briefly before the the, the major archive project for this year was um meant to be our um our history project in um Mozambique uh, mostly around Maputo uh documenting um stories of queer people um in and around Maputo and a lot of those interviews have been done already at the end of last year and beginning of this year luckily so no, we're kind of carrying on with transcribing and uh, translating from Portuguese Unfortunately, our conference and exhibition that were meant to happen uh, last month um in Maputo was obviously had to be put on hold um indefinitely. <laughs> so, um 
but in terms of the day-to-day the -day of the archive, unfortunately, physical visits to the archive obviously have stopped. Um, we've closed up, we're all working from home. And so we had to find a way of carrying on working and keeping people engaged. Um, so mostly we've been doing that through social media. Um, we've been doing weekly stories from um, stories from lockdown, where I've chosen uh, various collections in the archive and try to highlight them visually and with text, um, both on Facebook and Instagram. Um, other ways in which we've tried to engage is that we've tried to start a, an oral history project, um, documenting or hearing from um, queer people in South Africa and their experiences of, of lockdown, of COVID, of everything that's happening. Um, just to try and make sure that uh, queer experiences aren't lost in, in, in the overall narrative. So we're still going through those. Um, we didn't get much of a response in the beginning, so we actually formulated a Google form, which has worked better. It seems people like structure. <laughs> we initially said, please just send us poems, videos, anything like that like describes your experience. And I think people were daunted. <laughs> we sent out a, a series of questions, and, and that has worked better. Um, and then we've also been trying to document what all LGBTI organizations in South Africa are doing. What online events are they hosting? What fundraising are they doing? I mean, anything that's happening. So we're really just gathering, gathering, gathering at the moment. Um, we're also trying to host a few online events. Um, we had one a few weeks ago called Let's Gale. Um, as you'll see in, in the second image of Let's Gale, we are apologizing because it didn't happen <laughs> because Zoom went down worldwide at the time that we were meant to be hosting this. So um, I just wanted to include this to show that as much as we try and shift things online, they're always going to be problems. Um, mm -hmm. And this, oh, well, that's awkward poster speaks to that. Um, the, the, the difficulties in trying to engage online. And obviously, it's, it's it has um, very obvious problems of exclusivity, who has data, who has access, Sure. All those sure. kinds of things. And as I mentioned before, we, we really feel very sad that we've lost our our safe space, our library space, which was always an open door policy. And even when we reopen, hopefully next week in some capacity, we won't be able to have that kind of just open door policy for a while still. And, and that's sad for us. And then just one last thing. <laughs> I just, we, in terms of our activism, we're trying... We, we weren't quite sure what to do in the beginning because we're not a an organization that, that, that gives out um, a sort of funds and food and and things, but we, we just realized that we, there was such a large need that we have started to apply for emergency funding and we have gotten two of those to provide food parcels and hygiene parcels to the, the queer community, particularly the, the migrant community. Um, because the South African government, although it's it's giving out grants to South Africans, um, in practice, any migrants from neighboring countries like Zimbabwe in particular are, are not getting any of that help. So we are trying to figure out how to do that. Um, it's first for us that we will physically be distributing um, food and, and food. Yeah. So we're, we're learning to go. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. That that brings us. I'm I'm conscious of time, but that does bring us into the here and now and the the very real, um, really really well. Um, and what we might say is, we might, if we begin to open up the, the question and answer chat session and we begin to collect some questions there. Um, but I think uh, just to continue the conversation, I mean, actually that point about space feels so important. And Adira, you had nice pictures of people going into homes and doing oral interviews, which of course through social distancing now is impossible and, and um, puts huge puts both the, the, the archivist and the people being talked to uh, at, at huge risk. Um, but I think it also reveals the point about the kind of the home as being a supposed safe space in lockdown, um, the space where you retreat and stay well. And that is premised on the idea that you have access to online data and you can communicate to other people that you can continue your life in so many ways. Um, and, and Linda, so your experience about trying to collect data from that experience is itself interesting. It's, it's the structured form that people like. 
Um, <laughs> I wonder if you could all reflect a little bit, or, or you know, how. So while we have a powerful narrative about what to do around COVID, about the lockdown rules, about the way to behave, how, using your experiences, how could we think about and record the less structured parts of life right now, the ways in which um, those, those experiences that don't fit into the uh, communicative world with, with uh, you know, the, the, we can't reach out through a Google form or we haven't got access through Zoom. What about the people who are left off the grid uh, through the way in which the world is now working through COVID? Are there any ways that you can think of through your work so far that we could capture some memory of that or create a space for people to recall that experience? Your oral history project, Linda, is obviously doing a bit of that, but even so, you know, the, the networks that, that we use. Well, we, we're, also, we're also documenting like our, our weekly youth forum that used to happen in the library is no longer happening, but they have continued that conversation via WhatsApp. And um, so WhatsApp is something that, that is obviously quite accessible in South Africa, even to those who maybe don't have um, computers and and fancy phones. Um, so we, we, we're archiving those conversations as well um, amongst the, the youth forum. So that's, that's one way. But you know, we have to be careful about issues of privacy and things like that and and discuss exactly how those are shared. And, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Adira, do you want to um, say something about, I mean, you've been working with family albums there and that idea about family space in your work has been crucial. Um, do you think that the impact of COVID uh, will, you, how, how will the impact of, how will COVID uh, impact on the, the, the spaces, the domestic spaces in the communities you've been looking at, do you think, and, and how will that shape your project going forward? Uh, can you hear me? Sorry. Yeah. I think I had there. Yeah. So uh, it, it, it's hard because uh, certainly a lot of the work that I was doing is with my personal work as well as with the Anglo Indian project going forward for all of us is going to be a lot harder to actually go into family spaces and handle archives physically because that is a thing in itself which becomes difficult now and we have to think of many ways in which we can first sort of you know a thousand precautions because you, before one can even ask to enter something home so that itself is something that we have to rethink completely and i i don't know i think um yes definitely it is a, a question in which um one's access to the becomes crucial when one thinks about uh, any kind of you know work at this juncture which itself is a flawed thing because a lot of the communities we've been working with with the Anglican project they're all elderly people and they don't have that awareness or the access to the online space in which they can upload files or send things to us and so it's not something is accessible to us either to even think about that as an option. So we're already thinking of a younger audience who would, you know, be interested and who would, who would contribute. So it's, it's a it's a it's a strange space that way. I think what a lot of uh, you know what a lot of us are also hoping for that at some point down the line things would you know slowly get back to normal and we could then go back and access. So that's a that's also a sort of a big hope right because we don't know if that's ever going to really uh, be the case for the next i don't know how many months or perhaps years that we can actually go back to that mm. so it's a, it's a strange uh, situation that way i don't have the answer to actually what to do about that at this point we can try to you know be in spaces which are accessible online but then you know like uh, I, I really i really don't know it's a tough it's a tough situation that way and i think all museums, archives, and institutions, everybody is struggling through that right now. Yeah. yeah. Definitely. Siva, do you want to, I mean, I know that your Kashmir project, um, I mean, that's you've ended up putting that on hold quite considerably because of, of COVID. Do you want to yeah. say a little bit more about how COVID has impacted that project? I think it's, it's just added on to the issue, but working in lockdown is not something new for me or Kashmiris, I guess. Kashmir has always been 
lockdown for most of the time. So uh, people who have been helping me to, through this archive and collecting photographs, they have already ways, you know, through work around uh, the internet ban or the lockdowns. So when I started this project in the beginning of this year, uh, so I had people who used to bring documents, printed documents to Delhi. And from there, I used to travel from Chennai or Gujarat to Delhi to collect it. So we have reduced uh, the use of technology. So we have to travel. But since the COVID, we can't travel to the houses, the places where you call safe places where you can get into people's house and discuss about the family photograph now you can't get into the houses as well but we have always found way working in kashmir because you know either the families will bring the photographs or the documents or they'll courier it to you and you give it back so this is how i used to work in the beginning when there were there was uh, internet shutdown in kashmir so lockdown is new for the world but it's not new for kashmir they've always found ways to work around it so what you're describing is almost a, you know a, a, a flip side. So that I mean that actually, when in other cases it's the mobility that people have, have lost and have moved online. But but in Kashmir it was losing the online mobility, but you had physical mobility. Yeah. That's also yeah. shut down too. Um, I'm to our, to our guests and listeners. Please do feel free to to enter a question um, on the, the, the chat function here. I think Sunil has sent, set up a message so that you can find that. But so we, we as is so often the case, it's very easy to find um, all the, the really huge negative impact that COVID ha has had on our lives. Um, do any of you see any kind of positive opportunities about archiving and reaching different communities and, and, and mechanisms for questioning different structures that have come out of COVID? Um, I suppose one positive that's come out for us is that the, the LGBTI sort of network of organizations in South Africa, which often didn't communicate as much as they should and work together as much as they should have have come together quite a lot and there's weekly meetings between all these organizations and campaigns and fundraisers to try and get money and supplies to to queer people in need and it's so it's it's yeah it's, i mean it sounds a bit cheesy but it's kind of brought <laughs> brought different organizations to, together in a way that hasn't happened in quite some time so yeah If you do, if the other, Siva and, and Adira, if you want to come in on that too, but we've also got a question, which is from Sahaba. Thank you. I, I address primarily at Adira, but, but, interest, but, but opening up responses from others too. So Adira, you talked about, um, mentioned that older segments of the community are somewhat excluded from the pandemic workarounds, so all the move online, the technology emphasis. Um, what about you know what about their stories in terms of the memorialization of COVID-19 um how might we make space for elderly people uh, uh I guess and, and I guess that's a section of, of the community that we don't often think about in terms of activism really elderly sections of society um what are the ways that that you think we could bring those communities in a little more um I mean um so I'll just sort of quickly reflect on that and um, everybody please feel free to also come in with your thoughts. I think one of the ways in which, um, I mean, it's, it's the, the thing about COVID is also that it has disproportionately affected the elderly community around the world also. So that's, a, you know, the, the threat is also more to access them you know, largely also because of the pandemic. So that is another sort of thing that one has to always deal with when thinking about how do how does one access uh, a section of the community which is which is much more a threat from us. You know, even going into their spaces. So that is, uh, and I think one of the ways that we can think about that is not that getting the younger people to translate their stories, but to have a sense of community in which 
you know people within family groups people within community networks are talking to each other you know who do have access to each other like i have access to my grandmother so i can talk to her and get maybe some way in in a way in which to get her on a phone conversation you know so i think that has to happen on an individual level where we have to figure out these problems individually with each person that we are or each each person that we are trying to access or talk to i think that we have to build these networks and that is uh, it's a it's a harder thing because it's much harder than walking into somebody's house and saying we want access to your archives and talk to us and they're you know willing to talk to us here we have to go through a lot many more networks but i think one needs to make that effort and that's what you know one of the things that one needs to do now in order to and 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 that's i think that one of the ways we can think about that so that kind of connects back to Linda's point too about you know actually it's not just about how we remember that has to shift how we communicate right now has to yeah. shift and the kind of the ways in which we connect with people you can't take certain you know previous practices for granted. Yeah. Um, yeah. If other people want to come in on that question too, um, but we have had another question um, from Kevil Hari um, Kasiva in particular about uh, the way in which. In the increase of surveillance of journalists in India um, and the co-opting of mainstream journalism as the government's mouthpiece. So the tensions around the, the state in India, how has that impacted the way that your work in Kashmir has been received? And I would say here also uh, that this connects to a theme that was dealt with in one of the other conversations held as part of this kind of curated group, which was looking in particular at uh, the way in COVID relates to states the rise of state authoritarianism uh, and and more fascistic tendencies across the world too but but siva yeah i mean do you want to talk about how well would you like to respond to kevel's question really about um state surveillance in this too i mean this isn't just your translating of a story there's various increased layers of power and translation that you need to address as you bring things forward uh to answer cable's question i my work has been polarized uh, in India. There are many who support it, many who want to know about the history, the photograph, while many who are still in denial, who doesn't want to talk about the issue. While uh, there's a lot of what about tree going on when I, whenever I talk about uh, Kashmiri Islam community, there's questions about Kashmiri funded community and the politics behind it. So yes, it's it's not received very well with everyone in India, but it's good. Some are actually willing to at least hear about it, listen to the you know they are the Kashmiri side of the story. I'm happy for that. And for the the other part of the question is about surveillance. While I don't know whether I've, I'm under surveillance or not yet, the mind of what. And more importantly, I'm not, I'm not reporting uh, issues in Kashmir. So I'm sort of in the background as an activist trying to visit for human rights. So yeah, the problem with the Indian, uh, Indian state is that journalists, you know, when you're reporting a hard news, then it becomes a problem for them because more people consume it. Have you? Could you say a bit, Siva, about what's happened to the project since lockdown? I mean, you were you were working in Kashmir and left. Well, I mean, you were asked to leave, right? Yeah, uh, but I completed completed most of the work from there, so it was not a big deal. Because when I the, the people who were helping me around, they constantly kept me aware that anything can happen here any day. That's what every Kashmiri tells you. So you're not dependent on time. So whenever you have time, you have to act. So that's how I worked there throughout every day, every single day. So we always knew something is going to come up the next day. So we were always prepared. So in that way, it made me easier. Yeah, thank you. Um, so yes, this is Kevils added another question, which was the, is, is about um, balancing the safety of your participants alongside, I mean, your your own safety too, which we've talked about. Um, so I mean, I think that that we talked about that a little bit now in terms of kind of entering houses and exposing yourself. 
sorry, that sounds awful, um, putting people that you're involved with at risk. That wasn't what I meant to say at all. Uh, but um, the, um, I, I think this kind of goes back in one sense to that, those broader questions of ethics that we were discussing at the beginning about sort of um, one's role and responsibility as an archivist, as an insider and as an outsider. Um, and, and maybe, I mean, Siva, please do think about, you know, you've had direct issues around protecting the people that you're working with, but I imagine, Linda, that's also a part of the work at Gala and, and Adira, and in some extent, with your project too. So, um, you know, maybe if you could all reflect a little more about your kind of the role of the archivist um, and the power that you have over the people that you're archiving and how, how you exercise that responsibly. Uh, I think the people who are helping me, they're actually helping me and I'm not helping them. So whoever is taking me on the field visits, they know the place and they know when to take me so that none of the families or anyone gets into trouble. And if a particular place is very is under surveillance and then either they call the family to where I stay, which is the office where they usually come because uh, all the families are activists by themselves. They are part of Association of Parents of Disappeared Persons. So they come to the office and then there in the office, we have the discussion because me going to the uh, their houses will not cause any trouble for me. Even if an army person spots me, they'll just ask me to leave while the person, the family will get tortured. So there are different measures that I can't let you know exactly, but we are managing it. Identity-wise, the identity is not out. We always use a different name, a pseudo name, to hide their identity and place. Mm -hmm. Linda, do you could you talk a bit about the kind of yes, safety and power um, too? Yeah, so I mean, it's we give participants various options of using pseudonyms of. Um, uh, of um, also of, of having their their histories or their their contributions um, sort of embargoed for a period of five years or ten years or even until their death. Um, so people, oh, those are quite tricky because trying to find people five ten years later is um, difficult. <laughs> um, yeah, so there are the, the various ways. Um, uh, Participants can also always look over there the, the, the transcripts of the of the interviews before we make them accessible. Um, it, it was it was very tricky putting a lot of this stuff online um, the, as part of those 25 digitized collections because it's one thing you know a researcher going through a box of letters and seeing a name and you know checking with me personally if that can be used. But once things are online, you know, we had to redact so much stuff, like every address and every letter, every name, every phone number, every, it was, it was quite daunting. And it still freaks me out because I could have given something. <laughs> yeah, we, we were pretty careful though, it's, but it was a lot of work. Yeah. And responsibility. And, and when, yeah. And when in doubt, we, we just didn't include it. Yeah. It was, yeah. I mean, like, it, it's not like, I mean, in South Africa, we, we don't have, you know, it's, it's not like it's, we have political uh, or legal issues. I mean, we have a, a, a constitution that, that, that protects the rights of, of, of queer people, um, but it's obviously on the ground, that's not always the case, but yeah, so it is, it's, it, it is difficult. Yeah, we have to be very careful. There's, there's two more questions that it, I, I, I think I think are distinct, but I'm going to kind of frame them together and then ask the three of you to comment on them to, uh, as as you wish. So Eljo asks, um, Siva mentioned the idea of memory and resistance movements, um, and and asks you to elaborate further. But I think um, actually all three of you can talk about the role of kind of memory uh, in 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 the present. So sort of how one memorializes past events and identities and the importance of that in the present in the present or in, in present interactions. And and Menakshi uh, um, points to the importance of recording violence done to particular communities, particularly the migrant labor community in, in India as a COVID lockdown, but also kind of asks about voyeurism here. Uh, you know, at what point does recording deaths 
and starvation become a kind of passive violence itself. Um, and I think this brings us back to, again, that kind of the, the tension that we started with in one sense about sort of the archive as a sort of structural account of society, but also one which allows different voices to come through and, and kind of using the archive to humanize memory as well as to dehumanize it in the way in which the state has, you know, official archives have so often worked. Um, so, I mean, actually, maybe those are more interrelated questions, one about kind of memory and how memory forms a, a way of challenging some kind of more dominant narratives, but also that, that question about um, how to archive in a way that keeps human experience live rather than numerical statistics or kind of more passive violence, as, as Manakshi says. Um, we're documenting more the, the, the response, so we're not really going out there and, you know, counting infections or deaths or, um, and honestly, I mean, it's, I feel like while we're in it and gathering, it's hard to reflect on it yet and know how much we're going to make available or how much, yeah, I mean, it's, it is very hard to tell in the moment. We're just trying to gather as much as possible and then we'll figure it out um, in a few months' time exactly how we package this, I suppose, as a collection, which is what you're saying. It's, uh, yeah, how, yeah, the, the, the actual packaging of the work we're doing now is, yeah, we'll have to think about it quite carefully depending on, on what comes up. Yeah. yeah. There's always a gaze depending on where you're at you can be the gaze of the state or it can be a gaze that's critical of the state but you need to know where yeah. you're standing and hold that adira do you want to come in there you yeah. people move around on my screen and you looked like you were going to speak and then your picture disappeared so yeah, yeah um i think i just briefly reflect on the idea of memory and memorializing and uh, in the in the case of uh, the archive that we've been working with on the anglo indian question that is uh, the Anglo-Indian community has historically, over the last 70 years, especially since independence, but even before that, have been sort of stereotyped in various ways. So they really haven't had a, a, a sort of um, an, a platform in which um, a lot of them could actually talk about their own histories apart from, you know, themselves talking about it. You know, like there's not been a receiving end to that as much. Uh, so I think one of the things is that, you know, when one also creates an archive, you know, we also, as the three of us who are part of the core team of this project are all outsiders, even though we've had varying interactions with Anglo Indian uh, people from the Anglo Indian community, we all have to be aware of our own internal biases and our own internal gaze when looking at work. So, you know, when we look at photographs from the Anglo community, there are these stereotypical images that keep popping up, like musicians and dancers and, and people in the cabaret and parties. And, you know, these are the stereotypes. But then if they also show up in the family albums, and these are photographs being taken by people from the community of their own uh, celebra celebrations. So then it, it's a very different thing. But it always matters in the way in which we present that. Because then we have the power, if we put this up online also, then the order in which these images appear will also determine the way in which it is seen. And that is a huge power if one, if one does think about it. Because it can, it, it can be the difference between a stereotypical gaze and a gaze that is actually available for questioning and is accepting of a challenge to any gaze. So we always have to think about that, which is why it's so important for us also to have, you know, voices from the community constantly sort of giving us feedback on that and hopefully join us as well, because that would be the ideal way in which we could actually just, you know, sort of start thinking about that. Mm -hmm. And the violence of the gaze can be, of course, in situations like the crisis in India, which is being reported in various ways, whether that's from artifice organizations or also from the state, which is frankly not really reporting it. And even if they are it's in a really terrible way. Uh, so that violence can, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a difficult situation to even sort of even document. And what are the rights of the people who are being documented 
is something that you know one somehow it is very hard to consider in the immediate situations when photographers are out in the field or people are just recording things and putting them online as this is this is happening but you know things like informed consent things like the question of the gaze and things like if that person wanted to be photographed or if if it was a threat to have been photographed which is another thing we are seeing with the global protest around black lives matter as well like do you want as a protester to be photographed in a in a situation because that might be harmful for you even if it does become a very iconic and powerful image so those are some of the things i think that one keeps sort of challenging and questioning as people involved in looking at images and involved with images when thinking about memorializing also how to memorialize something and what are the various ways that one can do that I, I just want to say, like, uh, I'm glad that uh, Adira brought up uh, Black Lives Matter because it's it's now become not only the time of COVID, but the, 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 the time of this movement. So um, it's it's going to be something that we also need to think about in terms of our documenting and archiving is is how the queer community and queer activists are involved in that movement and, and the cross sections of that. Um, yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean. Come back to them in a bit. Siva, do you want to talk at all about kind of memory in yeah. Kashmir as well? I yeah, I'll just try to talk, answer both the questions together. The, the very first reason I started archiving Kashmir and the images in Kashmir is because when I initially started this project as a, you know, a reportage for a newspaper, I was struggling to photograph Kashmir because at one point I knew that whatever I'm taking there's an ambiguity behind it. Like, uh, I know the history of mass graves in Kashmir, and I couldn't go and shoot a mountain or a beautiful landscape there because I was always worried, am I shooting uh, a beautiful landscape or is it a bunch of dead bodies around there? So the idea of Kashmir is when, you, when you're looking at photographs, which Indian photographers are the uh, Western photographers or whoever is covering Kashmir, there's two extremes. One is that is very sympathetical, where people are crying, and the other one is very violent. There's no in between in these two images of Kashmir that I'm seeing. Or either it's it's very beautiful. So there are stages where people look at uh, a child crying and say, "Wow, it's a beautiful photograph," but it's not. It's a child crying, and when uh, there's a stone belt or like frozen mid air and then basically you're calling it a beautiful photograph what what do you mean by it's beautiful it changes when it's when you're talking about a conflict zone so that made me want to go and look at images that has not been uh, you know looked in the popular popular uh, medium or internet or whatever it is so that's one reason why I chose to sort of look at the personal photographs to humanize them. So when I brought back the photographs from the family albums to my house and when my mother saw it, the first question she asked me was, why are they not showing these in the television? Why are they showing only the, the brutality that's being uh, that's been done? And even if it's brutality, why, why are they not showing police brutality or the military brutality that's happening in Kashmir? So, the sort of intimate photograph from their houses created a conversation with me and my mother where she actually wanted to sit down and talk while if it was a violent image of Kashmir, she would be like, oh, it's the same thing that I'm seeing in everyday news. And she'll be more worried that I'm going there and working in such situations. And for the second question, memory and resistance movement, uh, all the activists in Kashmir are the families of victims of a person they want us to talk about their problems there's a famous saying uh, within the community within the organization which is came che karan which means we have to continue the work we have to keep talking about our pain we have to keep telling the world what what is happening out here so whatever means they find they they want to talk about the issue they want to keep talking about the brutality that they're facing every day. And memory is also the core for the state to keep altering, to polarize people. When we're looking at Kashmir, the history has completely been rewritten by the state of 
uh, India. And there's an alternate history when you talk to a Kashmiri. There's an alternate history when you talk to an Indian. Uh, there's, it's, it's always a gray, but people always take it as black and white. So I think that's why memory is very important in a resistant movement where you have to keep revisiting it and making sure that what happened in the past and how it's being changed by the power mm -hmm. currently. Thanks, Siva. I'm conscious. I think we've got five more minutes. Um, and and Ramla's question is about sort of what direction do you see the future of digital archiving and digital digitization taking post pandemic? But if we just kind of go back also to this, the, the point about Black Lives Matters, which of course has you know, this this panel has been a long time in the planning. And then, of course, actually what's happened in the last sort of eight days. I mean, I think particularly the, the, the long weekend has, has changed the conversation and it's almost you know, I think Black Lives Matters, the response to that movement in the last week or so has changed the global feeling about COVID on the one hand, but it's also interesting, you know, how far has the COVID situation changed that movement too? The, the um, George Floyd's words, I can't breathe, is obviously so potent uh, in, in the COVID moment. Um, and People have made the point that you know that it was with if that image the the video of George Floyd's last moments hadn't been taken you know the movement wouldn't happen that of course is true of Rodney King also some years ago um, so I mean there's more prevalence now of people with phones and videoing but I wonder if from the point of view of COVID but also from more recent events around Black Lives Matters. Um, if, if the, the, the panelists might want to just sort of reflect on, yeah, the role of digital technology taking us forward and how we remember COVID and, and this moment, this global moment more broadly. Um, that's a tough one. <laughs> Or maybe we can talk around also. What should we? Okay, so let's. I agree. That's a bit of a. a bit, but but what about what? Sh as people who are on Zoom, who have WhatsApp, who are involved in in this moment, uh, albeit from very different parts of society and impacted by it in very different ways, are there things that we should be doing to help make a digital archive or kind of take that project forward in more critical ways? Yeah, it's 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 always difficult to know. I mean. <laughs> As an archive, we, we try as much as possible to be somewhat um, objective, <laughs> but it's, which is obviously impossible. But yeah, so it's it's hard to know how much to gather. I mean, we, we try and gather news stories from, from the mainstream media as well as from queer media. Um, but now the, the the question that's come up recently: uh, Do we start, um, you know, to, to get saving screenshots of people's uh, public Twitter accounts of, of what they're posting on Facebook. And then if we do do that, how do we choose who to follow, who to document? Um, and uh, we don't quite have the answers yet. <laughs> In yeah. a state of fluidity. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I think one of the, sorry, I'll just no, no, add. Yeah. Uh, so one of the interesting things about having this digital space while so much is also going on is the fact that everybody you know a lot of people are online not everybody but a lot of people are online and so the fact the, the power of the archivist is and must also get dissolved that way in the sense that there are people who are making archives on their own you know people are at protest people are documenting things so there are friend groups on facebook on whatsapp who have archives of their own of what's going on so I think that that is something that across a little bit more time will begin to emerge and there'll be a thousand more archives, which is exactly what we want, I think, you know, which would be the best thing because there shouldn't be one center of archiving because then, of course, you run into the problem of who do you leave out and who do you not? Because if other people are also documenting this and they are and, and we know this because of Twitter, because of Facebook, because of spaces in which we can see what's going on also, not just through COVID, but also because of the Black Lives Matter protests. And even in India, when the anti-CA protests were going on in, in, in January, a flood of imagery of that, because people were taking photographs and taking videos. We didn't need journalists to be there all the time. So I think that's crucial. And that is an important step forward for, you know, for memorializing as well. Yeah, absolutely. Well said. 
we don't uh, as an archive we don't i mean you know it's a bit different for for my two co-panelists because they kind of work independently but you know as we are a sort of more traditional formal archive and and we don't have to archive it all anymore you know thanks to the digital age yeah it's the, 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 that pressure to keep a whole history is somewhat taken off our shoulders but, but we do have to at least follow trends and links and you know things also don't stay online forever which makes me also a bit nervous um but yeah, yeah. <laughs> siva do you want to add to that or are you i think the sort of archive is digital so it's going to happen anyway <laughs> <laughs> Great, thank you. We have hit our time. We're 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 at four thirty in the UK. That you know, not that that means anything. That's just one measure of time. We've we've hit the end of the panel. That's the important time. Um, thank you so so much, Linda, Siva, and Adira. I really appreciate you taking the time to join us for this. And thank you so much to our our, our, our audience who've been participating and and with questions too. And Mohammed Tafik Ali, thank you for your for your thoughtful comment there about um, the privilege that we have in these times. Um, we so thank you all for joining us. There'll be a recording of this that you can download online or watch online uh, after this. But we are going to have to close things off now. But thanks very much, and take care. Thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thanks, Thank Eleanor. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.